Uh, Uri uh, graduated in uh, neurobiology from the Weizmann Institute in Israel and then moved to the postdoc at NYU and now he's young faculty at Princeton. Yuri was invited because he has uh, improved and changed the way we can think about analyzing uh, fMRI data, imaging data. And today he's going to present some of the stuff that you can do with this new technique. Thanks, Yuri. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, let, let me start by taking all the collaborators because as usually it's a teamwork and it's never one one person work so I really like to take them at the beginning. I want to mention two of my postdocs, uh, Julia Lerner and Chris Ani. And also they worked on the Timescale project. I want to mention Lauren Silbert, Greg Stefan and Chris Thompson. They worked on the communication project and also some collaborators uh, colleagues, including David, Nava, and Thomas from NYU, with whom we recording the intercanal recording, and also friend from the Weizmann, Rafi, and also Marlene and Bruno. So, uh, people tend to give a context to, to their talk, and I will try to do it over here. So, so basically, what you heard to this amazing sessions and talks, so far people focused on really simple stimuli, as Gabor Pet says. This is not what I'm going to present today. So this is like the context. Basically, we're moving to more complex natural stimuli. So we're thinking there is a lot to learn from using simple stimuli, and this is what we saw. But the ultimate goal is to go and explain what the brain is doing in natural stimuli, in real life situations. So we try to work with more complex stimuli, we choose a particular kind of natural stimuli, which is movies, which is, on the one hand, is really natural in the sense that you're all going to the cinema and see movies all day long, but it's also highly structured. And it was designed by a filmmaker, so it's much more controlled. And it gives us a lot of power, and this is what I will try to prove to you. Another thing that is, if you think, even if you move from simple stimuli to natural stimuli, you still tend always to lock the brain and isolate it from the environment. So you give it in a scanner or you see the psychophysics room and you present your stimuli and ask him to interact with your stimuli. But what we do in real life situations is almost always interacting with other brains. So the first part of the talk I will discuss what we find using complex natural stimuli and it will lead us to talk about new line of research of how we're moving from a study one brain to moving how two brains interact. The protocol is very simple. Usually, simply you have to lie in the scanner, we project the movie into the scanner, you have the headphones to listen to the movie, and simply enjoy the movie. So, for, for subject theory, sometimes it doesn't seem as an experiment, and the question is whether we come with new technique that allows to extract meaningful information about the brain function using these natural stimuli. And we came with one method, and the method can extract signal and separate it from the noise. There are many sources of noise, some of them coming from the physics of the fMRI scanner, some are biological noises, some are cognitive noises, for example, if you are not paying attention to the movie, and, and we can separate these kind of noises from the signal, and there are two kind of signals that we are extracting. One signal is a signal that is served across all people, and the second kind of signal is a signal that is unique to individual, but it's not served by the group. The way we are doing it, if you have two brains watching the movie, it can be the same brain of an individual across two repeats of the presentation, or two different individuals, they are watching the movie, we're normalizing the brain to fit the same template, anatomical template, and then we can take the time course. In this particular brain area, let's say this is the auditory cortex, so this is time, this is the responses to the movie in this particular brain area, and use it as a model to predict the corresponding activation in the corresponding brain area. If we will go to another brain area, this is the visual cortex, let's say, we use it as a model to explain what's going on in the visual cortex of another subject. There is two ways to think about what we are doing. One 
is we measuring how similar are the responses across individuals. Mainly we see whether the responses in V1 in this particular subject is also seen in V1 of another subject. Another way to think about it is we're using one brain as a complex model to explain what's going on in another brain. And these two formulations will help us in different experiments. So this is to get a feeling of the data I will present you well, time courses. So this is time courses from one particular brain area. This is the superior temporal sulcus. We presented the movie twice to each individual. So we've got four subjects, S1 to S4. Each one watched the movie twice, so it's in blue and red. Hope that you can see that the responses for this particular subject are highly reliable during the movie watching. So you don't need the fancy statistics, you can really look and see it in the raw signal. There is a lot of correlation going on for this particular subject, but if you will pay attention across subjects, you can see variability in the group. These two subjects are correlated. These two have anti-correlation. These have zero correlation. So if you look on the group level, you can see a lot of variability. This is an example of responses that are unique to individuals, but are not shared by the group. This is another brain area. This is the primary auditor cortex. However, you can see that it's highly reliable within an individual, but it's also highly reliable across individuals. So if you look on the group level, you can see that the responses going up and down in similar fashion while you listen to the soundtrack of the movie. And this is an example of a shared responses across all individuals. This is the best example we have so far. This is it's called a movie by Hitchcock. As you can see, about 65% of the cortex saw reliable responses across all observers. This is including the entire occipital cortex, the entire parietal cortex, most of the temporal cortex and many frontal areas. This is the medial part and this is the lateral side of the cortex. And I think Hitchcock was known of his capacity to take control of people but take control of the viewer's responses. And what we see, we see the neural correlate of it, and we see that all subjects respond in the same way while they're watching the movie. So the, the question I will ask, is, is it really specific to movies? So now we're going to move to stories. So there is a wonderful event in New York City called The Mot, where people are going on stage and telling real life stories. And we pick one very talented uh, storyteller, Jim O'Grady, and played his, his story to the subject. Now we didn't test the sound, so hopefully the sound will work and I will play an example. No, the sound is not working. I'm not sure whether you were able to hear, but I gave you the text over here that you will be able to listen to what the guy was saying. So basically now, now we're simply playing the, the soundtrack. There is no visual stimulation. And what you can see, you lose the entire occipital cortex because there is no vision going on. Okay? So this another demonstration that our technique is really selective and it's also capturing the signal that is highly selective. But you can see that there are many brain areas that are correlated across listeners, and this is going from A1, going to the superior temporal gyrus, Wernicke's areas, parietal cortex, Broca's areas, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, precunus, and middle prefrontal cortex. So, so there's a huge network that responds in the same way across all of you while you're listening to a story. So this is like the basic finding. We said that there is a third responses across all viewers while they're watching a movie or listening to a story. And the question is, why should we care? What is the meaning of these third responses? Is it a simple artifact or is it a really interesting phenomenon that our brain responds in the same way? 
And, and the layout of my talk is, I will try to convince you that it's highly interesting phenomena and you really learn new things about the brain. So given that this is a method uh, symposium, I will start with some low-level aspect of the stimuli and also some ruling some low-level confront that can really make this observation really trivial. And then after we'll do it, we'll go and we'll reveal some aspect of this of the stimuli and output I will convince you that it's really highly interesting and we'll get more and more high level as this talk will progress. So let's start with a simple artifact. Is it simply like global arousal effects? For example, if I'm watching the movie, my heartbeat can go up and down in highly regulated fashion. There is an echo going on while I'm watching the movie, right? So, so that can use this highly reliable correlation that have nothing to do even with the brain responses, right? So in order to rule out this simple confound, we looked on the responses across different brain areas. So now instead of having four individual subjects, what you have, you have four brain areas. You have V1, A1, interparietal sarcas, and also lateral prefrontal cortex. Now instead of having two individuals, you have two average groups of subjects, independent group that watch the movie. So first of all, as you can see, you can see that the correlation now can get even to 0 0.86 or 0 0.93, so we have highly reliable responses across group of subjects. Another thing that you can see, you can see that the responses are completely different across different brain areas. This means, maybe I will stand over This means that each brain area is responding in a different way during the movie watching, but is responding the same across all observers. So this huge, highly reliable responses is actually highly complex spatiotemporal responses, meaning each brain area is doing something completely different while watching the movie, but it's doing the same across all of you. So this immediately rule out this like high global arousal effects, because you see you're really capturing some very complex spatial temporal dynamics that it really shared across all observers. Now there is another thing. People always say, I mean many people say that fMRI is an indirect measurement and therefore they're always reluctant to believe of, F of MRI is what it might be an artifact of the bold responses and, and if you don't saw it in single neuron or the electrophysical measurement will never believe you. So I think these people I'm not going to convince today. But, but these people that think that there is something in an fMRI, but still want to see the relation, maybe the next result will help. So what we did, we took an opportunity in NYU Medical Center. There's epileptic patients. The, uh, the surgeon implement electrode beneath the scalp in order to detect the, the local epileptic seizure location. So during this week, they are, they are waiting for a week sometimes in the hospital, wait, waiting to the scissor to occur, and sometimes they are willing to do experiment. And, and, this, and, and, and while they are sitting there, sometimes they are willing also to watch movies, and then we can do our experiments. And this was done with Chris Oni, which is a postdoc in my lab. So this is the location of the electrode across four patients that watch the movie. As you can see, it's pretty extensive. We are not covering everything. So for example, and, and the location is determined solely by clinical purposes. We are not having to say anything about the location of these electrodes. We are missing the parietal cortex, for example, or most of the occipital cortex. But it's pretty good uh, cover. This is the reliable responses across two repeats in the mo of the movie in the broadband power reliability. By broadband, you simply filter the signal 65 to 150 hertz. So it's really the high frequency modulations. And as, as you can see, they are highly reliable across, across this patient by watching the movie twice. This is the extent of the reliability across all electrodes. This is the reliability as a function of frequency. So we, we see a lot of reliable responses in the high frequency domain, but also in the low frequency domain. Okay, this is the, it's going from theta to alpha and low beta. You can see highly reliable responses. So now, if you compare, so this is 
the intracranial responses, and this is fMRI data obtained from subject in Princeton while watching the same movie, you can see the maps really look the same. So there is highly reliable, it's look at there is highly reliable responses in, in both methods. But we can do much more, given that the signal is reliable within each, each group of subject and within each method, we can try to ask what is the relationship between these two methods. Okay, so although we didn't record the data in the same time in the same patient, given that it's shared, we can ask whether the signal correlation is correlated across the two methods and one is the relationship between them. So this is, so over we take the responses in one electrode, this, and we take again the broad one power modulations, and we convert it with F dynamic responses, and this is the fMRI responses from the corresponding voxels that match this location of these electrodes. And as you can see, there is a strong correlation between the two signals. So you can think of fMRI as a low-pass filter of this high-frequency power modulation. And this is, again, the map when we work electrode by electrode. So what's nice about these results, because people already observed correlation between fMRI and the local field potential, what's nice about this result is that so far it was reported only in V1 by Nikos, and there was some recording in humans done by, by Rafi Malach and the Weizmann, that A1 is also correlated. And over here we see that it's much more extensive. Another thing that we are observing is that if you take the power modulation in slower frequencies, for example in the alpha band, you can see that it's anti-correlated with the bolt signal. So, and this is another demonstration averaging across all electrodes. So what, so what this tells us, it tells us that fMRI is linearly positively correlated with this high frequency modulation, but it's negatively correlated with this low frequency modulation. If you think of people that are doing ERPs, they only look in on this uh, low frequency domain. So basically, people that are doing ERPs will only look on this low frequency domain, and therefore you should expect to see negative correlation between ERP signals and fMRI. Another thing is that given that fMRI correlated with this high frequency modulation, actually sometimes it can have correlated with a more high frequency signal than what people in ERPs are doing because although they've got better temporal resolution, actually they never see these high frequency modulations. And we know that these high frequency modulations are correlated with the averaging firing rates. So now another question. So you saw that this signal is reliable and selective. But what does it tell us about the brain? Is it simply tell us about low-level properties of the stimuli, or these third responses running deep and going even to high order levels? In a way, we already know that it's coming from high-level aspect of the stimuli because we see it across so many brain areas, including the frontal cortex. But still, I think we want to separate these low-level properties from the high-level properties. So if you think about the signal, so this is, for example, an audio signal. If a lot of low frequency a modulation of the audio power, and I think it won't be surprising for anyone that knows something about the auditory system to say that A1 will follow this amplitude modulation of the audio power. Right? So if this is all what we are seeing, there's really something not interesting about it. But if you're capturing the meaning that's going on with the signal, and all these like low-level invariants, and this, this high-level invariant is actually served across people, that will start to be more and more interesting. So I can play you the recording, but you won't hear it. So this is what this sentence is, is saying. But how can we separate, and this is a big problem in our science, how can you separate this physical modulation from the more high-level meanings that are associated with this signal? Lenwit is a very unique uh, stimuli, and we can use this property in order to separate the form from the content. So what we did, we took the same story, and actually, we, and this is a translation of a Russian story. So basically, over here, you have a completely different sound properties that convey the same meaning to someone that knows Russian. 
And, and we try to make the stimuli as much as different as possible, so we also change the identity. So over, over here you've got a male voice, over here you've got a female voice, over here you've got an, a lot of background noises that you won't have in this. No, so they're really completely different stimuli. The only low-level feature that is similar across these two stimuli is the onset. Right. It's the onset. It's difficult to see there is a, a white line. Or a, it's the onset of the sentences. They are starting at the same time. So we have a situation that we've got a third content, but minimal third form. And now, if you, if you take brains that know different languages, you can really separate from, from, from content. So if you play Russian story to Russian listeners, or the English translation to English listeners, then you have a coupling of the form and content. But if you start to compare across these two populations, then you can separate it. So if you play the Russian story to English people that don't know anything about Russian, then you've got the same input that driving the system, but these two brains but this, but the English speakers cannot understand anything from the content. So we've got a situation that we've got the same form, and any correlation between them will have to come because they are listening to the same input. If, on, if you if you contrast now these two groups while while each listening to the story in his own language, you've got a situation that the content is completely different. So and each similarity across the brain will come because they are listening to the same the same meaning, okay? So you've got a, a situation where you've got same form but minimal third content, or similar content but minimal third form. This is the correlation within its language that listening to their own language. So again, so this is like a replication of what you saw before, and it's always nice to have replication, but basically you already seen the results that if you're listening to a story within your own language, you have reliable responses within this network. And it's nice to see that these correlations are, are sustained across cultures. But now we can use these third responses in order to compare the two. And what you see over here, this is the responses between the English and the Russian speakers while they listen to the same input, to the Russian story. So in this case, again, you don't have any understanding in the English group, so any correlation between these two populations coming because it's the same input, and many you, you can see the auditory cortex. Now, if you look on the other com uh, comparison, that we've got the same content because both could understand, but, but minimal third form, I think it's a very striking result. You see a lot of the cortex starting to be correlated across, across these two group of speakers. And if you think that the stimuli properties are completely different, the amount of invariant that will increase these third responses across these two groups is enormous. So the message of it is that what the brain is doing is generalizing a cross variation in forms to extract the meaning. So you can see immediately as you're leaving V, so what's striking about this result is immediately when you're leaving A1, v, A1 you can see that most of the cortex become invariant to this variation in form and you really care about the meaning. So this is one thing that is really strong about this result. Another thing is we are not saying that variation in form are not important. They're really important, but only for the low-level areas. So if you remember, there is some variation in form that are correlated across these two stimuli. And if you look, A1 is correlated also across languages, but it's correlated because there is some low-level aspect that are still maintained across these two stimuli. But once you go outside of A1, you cannot explain anything by correlation in this low-level form, because even if it's identical, stimuli, if you've got no meaning, you have no third responses. So immediately as you go from these early sensory areas, the brain is generalizing and extracting the meaning. So now that you saw this, we can ask further on, so what driving the correlation in its brain area? There can be similarities across the two stories on many different levels. You can have similarities in the grammatical structures, similarities in the lexical, uh, content, but you can have also similarities in the narrative, in the situation model. So you can think about the similarities occur on different levels of the story. So in order to test it, what we did, we took the story, now it's the same English story, and we scrambled it on different timescales. 
So we can play the movie backward, we can scramble on the word level, it will be like word salad. We can have intact sentences and then scramble, or we have the paragraph and so forth. So basically what's happening over here, it's the same input, the only difference is the structures over time. Okay? And any difference that's coming over here, it's coming because information over time getting different. You get different level of information over time as the function of scrambling. And what we see is, the, is as follows. You can see a nice gradient. You can see and we can zoom in over here. You can see early auditory areas doesn't care about the temporal structures. They simply respond to the moment-to-moment -moment information. And then you've got areas that respond to the word level, sentence level, paragraph level, and so forth. So it looks like an archy. For example, if you look on the responses in A1, it responds the same whether the story is reversed in scrambling on the word level, sentence level, paragraph level, or the intact story. If you move a bit forward, you can see that it stops responding reliably when, when you play the movie reversed, and you need word or more. In other words, you need sentences or more temporal coherency in order to drive these neurons. In other words, you need even greater temporal coherency so it will respond reliably only on the paragraph level or the entire story. So you can really see gradient when it's getting more and more complex. The responses require more, longer and longer temporal structures in order to respond reliably. This is the individual map to show that this is highly reliable across individuals. And when we did the same experiment in the visual system, we saw the same. We saw that V1 wasn't care about the level of temporal structures within the image. It would respond the same whether it was whether the frames were organizing in a meaningful way or were simply were scrambling over time. And if you go higher in the hierarchy, you can see these areas require more temporal coherency or temporal structure to respond reliably, and if you go even more until these areas really like, pref require longer temporal coherency to respond reliably. So if you combine the auditor story and the silent movie, you get this map, and basically you can see that early areas doesn't care about the temporal structures, and as you go, as you go higher in the hierarchy, you care more and more about the temporal hierarchy. And there is also overlap when you go to these higher order areas across modalities. So the way to think about these results, you have, you have areas in early sensory areas that really care about the moment-to-moment -moment responses. They don't care about, they can care about these sound pits, but they won't care whether it will occur within the world or somewhere scrambling within the stimuli. Then you have an area that have responded to longer time scales and they really integrate, let's say, across the entire sentence. So, so the responses of error is really dependent on the history and will respond differently if you will scramble the orders of these words. And then you've got areas that care even about longer time scales and they require the paragraph level of the entire story. So you can see a gradual increase in the temporal complexity that driving the history or the sensitivity to the history. And the same was the case in the visual cortex. This reminded us of, of spatial receptive field that people talked about during the meeting already. So we know that we have spatial receptive field and they're getting higher when you go from low level areas to higher other areas. And we've been thinking that each brain area also have a temporal receptive window and this one also getting larger as you move from early areas to higher other areas. So this area is really uh, analyzing the moment to moment input and these areas with the large temporal receptive windows really integrate the information from the past to what I'm saying now. So what did I show you so far? I saw you that we have shared responses and these shared responses to whether you see a movie or listening to someone telling a story. I saw that these responses are abstract, meaning that they're responding to highly high level invariance in the stimuli that can be shared across people and cultures. And we saw that these, select, that these responses are highly selective. Each brain area is responding to a different property of the stimuli and there is an hierarchy of complexity. So basically what's happening when you expose to real life stimuli, these real life stimuli evoke responses that actually are shared across all observers. And and it's not that only that the stimuli evoke responses, actually these responses have to be meaningful 
to the observer. So actually there is an error that is going both ways. And, and what the brain is doing is pick up all this invariance that is meaning to this group of individuals. And we think that these third responses will be observed across all species. If you will present a monkey a banana, you will see third responses across all monkeys because this is what is meaningful to this monkey. And in order to explain to you why these third responses are so important, I will, give, I will go to the communication problem. So if you think about communication, you can see the movie about this, brain, about this person that wants to commit suicide. And, and we know by playing this movie that you will all experience third responses. But now I can stand on the stage and tell you the story about this person that's about to commit suicide, although this person is not in the room. So how can I do it? It looks like a magic, right? I can simply transfer information that is not present in the room. So as opposed to a monkey that will always see the, the banana and will respond to it, we as humans can be detached from the physical environment. And now, although there is no banana or elephant in the room, I can speak about bananas. So this is give me a huge freedom. And the question, how do we do it? It looks like a magic. But if you think about the speaker, and you realize that the speaker also has similar brain responses as all other individuals, so he's also a listener, meaning that he's also connected to this network. So then the problem becomes much more simpler. Instead of trying to transmit the information, I'm taking advantage of, of the understanding that my brain is similar to your brain. So the task is not to transfer in something. So it's not that speaking and listening is completely different processes. It's the same processes because we all link. But the only thing that I need to do, I need to invoke the same invariants that are in my brain, now in your brain, in order for you to understand. And another point is that there is no magical connection. It's not like telepathy, okay? My brain is not wired to your brain, but it's like a wireless connection. I can transmit wave of sound, and this wave of sound trigger responses that are similar in my brains, now in your brains, and if I manage to do so, I'm not sure, because some of you I'm seeing that your brains are, are opaque, maybe it will be, get clear as I will move on. If I manage to transmit my brain states to your brain states, then we have an understanding. Also to notice that no one really looked how this information is, transfer, is transferring me between two brains. Most communication studies either look within the listeners while they comprehend sounds, or within the speakers while they produce sound. But actually communication is always have to be between two brains. So to test this uh, hypothesis, we have a fancy microphone that can record someone speaking in the scanner. The scanner is working, the microphone is working, actually it's two sets of microphones. One is 90 degrees to the mouth, so we only capture the noise of the scanner. One is parallel to the mouth, so we'll capture the scanner noise, but also the speeds. And now that we have a good model of the noise, we can subtract the two and then get the speeds. So he asked my student to tell a story in the scanner. It was a real life story. She was telling it as if she was telling to a friend something that happened in her life. And then we recorded her while selling the story. So we have her brain responses while she produced the story. And then we can play the recording to a group of listeners, and now we have also the responses in the listeners. So now I can use the speaker brain responses in order to try and model what's going on in the listener brain responses. What's good about this and, and, and what allowed this is another feature of the intersubject correlation. We don't know enough about what's going on in Wernicke's areas while I'm producing my talk now because we are not advanced enough in understanding what's going on in the brain. But if I'm using the, the Wernicke's responses as, as of the speaker as my model, I bypass the need to come with a model because I'm taking my model from the speaker. And this is what allows uh, this analysis. Another thing, there is some complexity in communication. If you think about it, there is some time delays. I have to think about what I'm going to say, then I have to translate it to motor command, I have to say it, and only then you can start trying to process and understand what I'm saying. So to account for this temporal dynamics, 
what we did, we complicated the model a bit and we shifted the responses of the speaker backward in time and forward in time. And now we have nine regressors that is used to model its corresponding brain area in the listener. And we do a lot of non parametric statistics in order to see that everything is valid. We, know, we can go later about all these uh, computational steps that we are taking. And now we can ask what is the correlation between the speaker brain and the listener brain. And what we see, we see a lot of coupling between the responses in the listener and speaker brains. This coupling is not localized to one area, but it's extensive to many parts of the network. We see it in early auditory areas, but then it goes to high order language areas as superior temporal gyros and Wernicke's area, to the temporal parietal junction, to Broca's areas, dorsolateral prefrontal areas, parietal cortex, precuneus mid middle prefrontal, even the striatum. So there are many brain areas that are correlated across the listener. This is what you see over here and what you saw before. This is the listener-listener correlation that are also correlated between the speaker and the listener. And this is the overlap in orange, basically, over here. In, before we go to interpretation, we did two basic controls. We see that it really have to do something with communication. First, if you play, if you ask a Russian speaker to communicate the responses and you play it to the listeners, in this situation, you've got a brain that's trying to communicate, but there is and the same input going to the other brain, but there is no communication going on. And in this situation, we saw no coupling between the brains. Also, if we ask someone to tell one story and we played another story, in this situation, one brain is communicating information, another brain is, is processing information, but the information is not coupled. And in this case, also, we see no correlation across the brains. Another confront that we were worried about is that the speaker is also a listener. Is it the case that because the speaker also listening to it himself, we see this correlation? It is a strange confront because it will require me to be in endless loop. If I really have to understand what I'm saying by listening to myself, I will never be able to communicate anything. But still we were worried about it. But over the, the temporal model can help us a lot. So if you remember, we shifted the regressor in the speaker backward and forward. So negative values mean that the speaker responses are proceeding. Positive values mean that the listener is proceeding. Zero lag in this axis means that the responses are time locked to the moment of vocalization. If you look in the listener listeners, you can see that the temporal model doesn't do anything. Most of the information is time locked to the moment of the speech. If you look on the speaker listener, you can see that on average the responses are shifted in time, meaning that the speaker brain responses are coming before what's going on in the listener responses. So you can think of the speaker as the, uh, there is a causality relationship. By speaking now, I'm trying to make your brain similar to mine. I'm driving the responses in your brain and try hard to make them similar to mine. Sometimes I, f I fail. For example, if people now are falling asleep, there is no way that I can penetrate, but this is what I'm trying to do. Okay? This is, this is again, this is the correlation with, with, across the listeners, across all voxels. You can see that everything is time lock to the moment of vocalization. If you look more carefully on, on the better weights across the brains, you can see that although on average the speaker proceeding, you can see also that A1 actually is, is, is time lock to the moment of vocalization as you, as you expect, and this is a really nice control. But we also were really surprised to see there are areas that actually the listeners look like is preceding what's going on in the speaker brain. So it looks like there is some also anticipation. This is at least the interpretation we came with, and we need to do more experiment over it. But look, there is moment areas in your brain that actually preceding my brains, and, and, are, and sometimes we're really trying to predict what I'm going to say even before I'm saying it. So now that we connected the speaker and the listener, we can ask if this coupling between brains is highly informative, then it has to be also related to communication. So what we did, we measured the level of understanding in each observer, so we know how much information was transferred between each uh, between the speaker and each of the listeners, and then we can correlate the amount of coupling 
with the amount of understanding, and there, you can see there's a strong correlation between them, meaning that the more you correlate with the speaker brain, there is more understanding going on. And the understanding is even getting stronger if you look in only on the areas that care about this predictive coding. Over there, you can see that the correlation even increases. This means that, and, and, and we think about it, do we click? If our neural responses are correlated, then also we are understanding that each other. And there is moment that you speak with someone and you know that he understands you, and there are moments that you feel there is a glass between you and the listeners. And this is the moment when you have this no neural coupling. So I have to wrap up. The, uh, one, one major thing about it that I think it's linked perception in action on many different levels. It's mean that areas that produce speech are also correlated when you listen to speech, so there is a strong correlation between perception and action. It's not mirror neuron, so it might be related to the mirror neurons, but what we see are not mirror neurons effects. And given that I don't have time to go, I simply will conclude and say, moving to natural stimuli and, and looking across brain, it's really an open a new field of study, and I think it allows to link all this important low-level work that, that we observe over here with, with our ultimate goal is to understand how the brain is, is working in these real-life complex situations. And by going to this all the way up, but still trying to preserve the relationship to this low-level effect, and I hope that I convince you that you can really learn new things and get new insight about the brain also in this high-level complex uh, world. Thanks. There's time for one quick question while we set up the next speaker. Have you tried telling jokes? No. I mean, there are some jokes in the story. And I think you should not laugh while you're in the FMI scanner. I know that is a good portion. Should I use that adapter or my own? Does it matter? It's good. You can try. Reading, reading is a good protocol. Basically, we believe that we will also see the self responses by reading. That, 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 we, we never tried it, but that's what we believe. You can use the exact same setup to look for different sets between first language and second language and see whether. The same way that I use during first language are also correlated during the second language of the system. Actually, all our Russian speakers are being lingual, so you can look at it. But in this particular design, we only started with the Russian yeah. and then the English, and we have also an ordering effect. Oh, okay. So, should I use this or not? Okay. Counter order. Counter balance the order. Okay, should we move on with the next talk? Okay, next talk is by Frank Tong. Frank uh, did his PhD at Harvard and then did a short postdoc at UCLA and became faculty at Princeton and then moved to uh, Vanderbilt in uh, Tennessee. And Frank uh, has introduced a completely different way of doing fMRI data analysis, which is instead of looking at the average activity of bunch of voxels or the, of the activity of individual voxels is looking at the distributed activity across voxels. And we'll see what we present. Thank you, Franco. And uh, thanks very much to the organizers of this uh, wonderful conference. It's uh, been a really exciting and a, a great learning experience for me uh, since the beginning of the session. Um, I was wondering, could we turn down the lights just a little bit? Not too much, but just a little bit downward. Thanks. Um, so. I, this talk is both a mixture of general, more, more, more general background and also more specifics on the science. And I thought, starting with a more general perspective, uh, and also following our previous speaker, uh, Uri Hassan, why not start with a, a story as well? Uh, let's start with a, a, a science fiction story. I'll call the science fiction story number one. Um, imagine that by measuring patterns of brain activity from the human brain, it is possible to determine 
precisely what a person is looking at. So here we have a subject and we've um, strapped this person into the scanner. Uh, they've kindly volunteered to stay in the scanner for the next day or two. Uh, they're outfitted with an IV, possibly a catheter or a bedpan, and uh, we're just presenting lots of images to the subject and, and have managed to get clearance from IRB somehow. And, uh, and after scanning lots of brain pictures, we present a randomly selected image and poof, here it is. And uh, we look at the person's brain activity and we say, aha, yes, indeed, it, it is the painting uh, done in an impressionist style with the apples, the plate below, the vase, Cezanne-like, but not actually painted by, Ze Ce painted by Cezanne. It is indeed Louvre painting 1049 with 99% confidence. We will try to identify this painting. Uh, would this uh, be an impressive feat or not? And if we could do this, does this necessarily indicate that we understand the neural code for vision? I'm not going to answer this question right now, but just keep that in mind. Now let's shift gears a little bit. We'll switch to a second story, science fiction story number two. And uh, imagine if by measuring a person's brain activity, uh, it could reveal what item is being attended. So uh, just before this talk, I just randomly selected an image from Google Images, and I want to figure out which of these two objects captures your uh, attention. And uh, lo and behold, this, this image was actually created uh, before uh, Bristol Palin appeared on Dancing with the Stars. Um, uh, and and so, so would it be possible to scan your brain, even if your eyes were fixed like, like one of John Monsell's monkeys? Could we scan your brain and know which of these two entities better captures your attention? Or let's say through a very uh, unusual and special intimate act of bipartisanship, these two individuals now become fused and occupy a single spatial location. Uh, would it be possible to scan your brain and tell which of these two objects you're focusing your attention on? And uh, as a final variant of, of what I like to call uh, mind reading, uh, Imagine if we present you an image, and uh, it's very salient, uh, but then it goes away quietly for a time, you know, memoirs aside. You know, could we scan your brain and know when that image is being held in your mind or not? So, stepping back to science fiction story number one, that of brain reading, uh, it turns out that this experiment uh, has been done. And, uh, and a striking example of this was done by Jim Haxby and colleagues. Uh, and, uh, what he did was he measured core scale activity patterns in the ventral temporal cortex. And uh, these regions tend to like uh, various types of objects or respond well in general to objects. And they wanted to know whether it would be possible to predict what category of object the person was looking at. They showed various categories, faces, houses, cats, bottles, scissors, shoes, and so forth. And uh, it has been known for a long time that there are certain hot spots in these object areas. For example, there's a, there's a face hot spot that you, you'll hear, uh, hear more about from Vinrick. Uh, there's also a region that responds strongly to, say, houses, but there's not really a bottle region or a shoe or chair region of the, of the brain. And so what you might observe in these studies, and I'm just going to show you a cartoon. Let's say you show a bunch of chairs, a bunch of shoes, and you measure this pattern of activity. And at a gross level, uh, in a given region, maybe there's not uh, much difference in amplitude of activity for, say, chairs and shoes. But if you look at a finer scale, there's sort of this, this undulating topology varying over the scale of, say, several millimeters. And the undulations look a little bit different here than here. Uh, is that just noise, or is there any reliability to those variations? Uh, what you can do is you can look at the spatial pattern of activity on one set of runs, and create these, sort of these average templates. You can call this the, the training template. And you want to then predict what the person's seeing on a subsequent set of runs. And uh, you can do that by just doing, say, simple correlation or more fancy analysis. And what Haxby and colleagues found was that these correlations were positive, whereas the correlations across categories tended to be lower, hovering around zero. And on this basis, they could predict with good accuracy what category uh, the person was looking at. And so how do we understand this type of performance, and to what extent can we push this, what I will call, brain reading uh, game here? Uh, well, looking at the organization of the visual cortex, and David Heger gave a, a, a very nice outline of, of, of its organization, we know that um, there's a detailed retinotopic map uh, that separates the different early visual areas and even the higher visual areas. So here I'm showing the right hemisphere. This is the occipital pole. This is an inflated brain, so you can see inside the sulci. Uh, this would be the primary visual cortex here, representing uh, this portion of the visual field. And you have the, the early areas. And Haxby and colleagues was looking at the, the ventral surface anterior to these strongly retinotopic regions. And uh, these regions respond more to complex objects uh, than to just simple patterns. 
So we have different levels of representation where there's sort of uh, object codes in these higher areas. We have strong retinotopy on the scale of centimeters in the early visual areas. But if we zoom in at a very fine scale, um, if we could say look at just uh, a, a single small chunk here and we were to enlarge that, this is a optical columns that were actually imaged uh, in the macaque monkey, uh, we know that at this very fine scale there are cortical columns sensitive to orientation. We would like to ideally maybe find a way to read out these fine scale signals as well, not just retinotopic signals, but whether this would be possible with neuroimaging in the human uh, remained an open question at the time. And so how should we try to measure these brain signals and understand them? Uh, a traditional approach or, or a very uh, useful approach is to think about how uh, a visual stimulus strikes the eye and is encoded by the visual system. So the retina has these sort of circular center surround receptive fields as does the lateral geniculate and orientation selectivity emerges in V1 or um, direction selectivity in V1 and very prominently in area MT for instance. Then would it be possible to read these signals in certain brain areas such as V1 and decode what visual pattern, feature, or object the person is seeing. Decoding is sort of the reverse property of trying to look at the brain signals and infer something either about the stimulus or in a more interesting case I will argue the person's mental state. And that's what we'll be talking about here. So focusing on the problem of orientation because uh, this is a very hard thing to do uh, in neuroimaging. As a neuroimager, I, I should admit, uh, is that, that a lot of us suffer from uh, electrophysiology envy. We really wish we could put electrodes into normal human brains and record individual neurons. But unfortunately, uh, that's not feasible nor ethical. And so we'd like to find other ways to, uh, to get around this and try to measure and approach a little bit of the selectivity that's possible uh, with, with uh, neurophysiology methods. And uh, I was very lucky to have a postdoc in my lab, Yukiasu Kamatani, who came up with the idea of, do you think we could uh, try and decode visual orientation? And he developed a method to, to try and do this. What we did was we presented eight different possible orientations uh, in the first study we did, uh, showed it to the subject, and we measured the patterns of activity using these crude fMRI voxels, three by three by three millimeter voxels from the visual cortex. And we used uh, linear classifiers to try to classify which of the eight orientations we thought was most likely to be there. And at the final stage, we just had a simple nonlinear step. Whatever um, discriminant function had the greatest activity level, we'd make a prediction saying, oh, let's try to guess that it was that of the orienta eight orientations that was physically presented. Um, I will show this briefly since we have a little bit of time just to explain the math of uh, classification. And, and John Montz already alluded to this. So uh, if we had just two voxels, uh, basically we would have a, a multi-dimensional space and with n voxels this is just becomes an n-dimensional space. And in this multi-dimensional space the response to any given uh, orientation could be plotted as a single point. And what we have are sort of clouds of dots that represent the the pattern of activity to different orientations and you can use a variety of decision rules or uh, uh, methods to classify, linearly classify the data separating it using this uh, hyperplane. And this method's linear because the hyperplane is, is, is a flat thing with a single vector as, a, as the discriminant function. And uh, in, in, our, in our hands uh, a variety of methods work and we, we tend to prefer uh, support vector machines. So when we ran this study in the scanner uh, and we showed subjects uh, each of eight possible orientations, we were very surprised when we tried to classify the orientations and this was how well we could predict from the activity patterns. And so how is this possible given that orientation columns reside at the scale of submillimeter structures and we were measuring signals from the visual cortex using these large clunky three by three by three millimeter voxels. Uh, it took a long time actually not to get this basic analysis or to succeed at decoding, what took us a lot longer was figuring how is this decoding possible. And Yuki came up with a, a, a very clever idea. So here I'm just for illustration, I'm superimposing three by three millimeter voxels on this surface here. And imagine that, and this is actually the, the response of a example, example voxel. You can see that it's strongly responding to each of the orientations and has a small undulation if we did a statistical test, it would not be significantly uh, 
different in its response to the different orientations. Nonetheless, maybe the small undulation reflects a weak, a very small but weak amount of true information, a true preference of the voxel. Uh, how do we know that's true? It might be hard to know from any single voxel, but let's say in this voxel there happens to be 51 versus 49 vertical to horizontal columns. In this one, 52 to 48, this one 50-50, this one 49-51, and so forth. Each voxel would provide just a teeny amount of information, but if the response of each voxel is, is largely independent, then pooling the information from many voxels could lead to a robust prediction of what orientation the person is seeing. And in essence, that's what we think we're doing, that due to the random variability in the local distribution of these columns, um, unlike Hubel and Wiesel's sort of famous ice cube model, these organic structures have you know, a, a fine structure, but also natural variability. So in any given voxel, there may be slightly more of one column or another. And so this is our notion. Uh, can we test and elaborate on this? Uh, more recently, a postdoc in my lab Yasha Swisher, uh, devised a multi-scale pattern analysis method to try to address what the scale of the information is that resides in the cortex that we're reading out with fMRI. And what we'll do, I'm just going to focus on the CAT data for the purpose of this talk. Uh, we analyzed data from Sungji Kim's group where they could actually isolate the orientation columns of the CAT. And what we're going to do is we'll high pass or low pass filter the data into higher low spatial frequency bands and say, well, do we still find orientation information? And if so, how much is there? And the human data were largely consistent uh, with the CAT data. So the key point here is that uh, when we low pass filter the, the, the data, you can see that here you can see the columns. With a bit of low pass filtering, you can still see them. And with more severe filtering, the columns go away. Nonetheless, the colors indicated on this map indicate a statistically reliable orientation bias in that region even though you can see the columnar structures obliterated with severe low-pass filtering. What happens in terms of the overall orientation information we extract when we apply pattern classification to these activity patterns, either the original image or these filtered images that lose that fine scale information, is a, a graceful degradation or a gradual loss of orientation information. But it doesn't go away all at once. Uh, it persists up to very coarse